In the last part of the series, part 65, we spoke about the difference between the Jesus of the Quran and the Jesus, Yahshua, of the Bible. We saw clearly that the Jesus that the Quran speaks of was not the Yahshua HaMashiach of the Holy Bible. We see that they were only similar by name, but nothing else. And that's where much of the confusion occurs within Islam when they believe that they are worshipping the same God. It's a part of understanding that needs to be understood when trying to comprehend these religious distractions. But Islam needs to be understood in order to understand much of the events that take place in history after it. From part 2 through part 57 of this series, we went through the scriptures in order to gain a foundation of the truth. But as we continue to go into history, we see less of the truth and more smoke and mirrors. We see the enemy strong at work through the centuries, working in men to help fulfill his goal and bring us to the exact point in time we are at today. Do you remember what Satan's goal is? It's to be like the Most High. And he has been working through men over the many centuries through secret societies, monarchs, and false religious structures to achieve this very goal. This is why there are secret societies. And his goal of being like the Most High is the major secret of their societies. Now this subject that we will cover in this video is an important one. It took a while to make this video because initially my plan was to go into explaining Mormonism and Jehovah Witnesses. But the father stopped me in the middle and showed me that I was rushing and other things needed to be exposed and brought to the light first. There are so many people today that talk about the Illuminati, the New World Order, the sellouts, and the global elite. And that's a good thing because it shows that many are waking up. But the truth is, it is hard to understand this matrix by just understanding the present day or even the last 100 to 150 years. In order to have a solid grasp on all of these conspiracies and understand the plans and devices of the wicked, we have to go further back in history. These plans to establish Satan as the God worshipped by all, for him to try to realize his goal of being like the Most High, they did not just come about in the last couple of centuries. This New World Order has been orchestrated in secret over many centuries through many groups, organizations, monarchs, and families. We are just at the climax of all those plots and schemes. The thing is that you cannot have a solid grasp on these plots and schemes without going back in history to the many holders of these secrets and plots. A good place to start is with the Knights Templar. Have you heard of them? Maybe or maybe not, but much of the wicked influence of today can be traced directly back to the Templars and the groups surrounding and intertwined with them. But many of us do not know much about them. We should though. So I'm going to try to break them down to you. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So I'm going to do just that right now. Let's begin. Okay, so it's really hard to break this group down in one video, but I do not want to devote two videos to them. So I'll be condensing a lot of information. I have a lot of books on this subject, but for this video, I will be using a lot of information from the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail. They've done a massive amount of research and compiled it together, but the researchers are not on Yahshua's side. This is a good book to read if you have a solid foundation in the truth. This book is about the coming Antichrist side and his lie, and the Templars are part of the foundation of this story. Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code pulls a lot from this book. Anyone that attempts to say they know who the Antichrist is, I mean, the ones that say Barack Obama and the Pope are the Antichrist, but they do not use any of the information from this book in their analysis, they are often very wrong. But I digress. The Templars are a subject that should be understood. It all goes back to when Islam begins gaining dominance in the Middle East. The Arab followers of the new religion of Islam declared a jihad, a holy Islamic war, against the Byzantine Empire. Just for some background, in the year 395, the Roman Empire was formally divided into the Western Empire ruled from Rome and an Eastern Empire ruled from Constantinople. This Eastern Empire will be known by historians as the Byzantine Empire. In the year 622, Muhammad began to unite the Arab tribes into a powerful fighting force through his preaching of Islam. His most important act during his early years in Medina was to pass down a revelation 
giving permission to his followers to go to war against those identified as their enemies. According to Muslim scholars, this concept of jihad, or holy war, can legitimately be applied against injustice and oppression, or against the rejectors of what they feel is the truth of Islam. By the time of Muhammad's death in 632, he had unified the Arabs under the banner of Islam, a religion as well as social, legal, and political institution, and they now had a justification in the name of their God for war and conquest. So like I was saying, the Muslims declared a jihad against the Byzantine Empire. In 636 AD, the army of Amar invaded Palestine, and by the summer of the following year, the army was encamped outside the walls of Jerusalem. In February of 638, after a seven-month siege, the Christians were forced to surrender to the Caliph Umar, the Muslim commander. Umar then goes to the Temple Mount called the Haram al-Sharif by the Muslims, the noble sanctuary, where his purpose was to search for relics, among them what he called the Mihrab or prayer niche of David, which Umar heard the Prophet Muhammad speak of. Umar also had a temporary mosque built at the southern end of the mount, on the spot where the Al-Aqsa Mosque stands today. They started building the Al-Aqsa Mosque 60 years later. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is the third most holy site in Islam. It should not be confused with the Dome of the Rock, that is also in Jerusalem, which is the most famous Islamic site in Jerusalem. It is not a mosque, but a holy shrine for Muslims. Muslims believe the Dome of the Rock to be where the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven on his night journey. It was completed around the year 691. A note for all Bible deniers, if Jerusalem wasn't such an important place, none of this history that we are speaking about would have taken place there. Now, following the Arab conquest of Jerusalem in the year 638, the city's largely Catholic history likes to generalize it and say Christian which has been a part of the major confusion surrounding the faith. Anyways, the Catholic population enjoyed a long period of good relations with the Muslims, but by the 10th century, the Muslims had become more aggressive. Starting in the year 1004, the Fatimid Caliph al-Hakim, who ruled over Egypt, North Africa, Palestine, and southern Syria, launched a campaign of anti-Christian fanaticism. By 1014, over 30,000 churches had been destroyed and many Catholics were forced to convert to Islam. But the critical turning point in Western attitudes towards the Muslims came in 1009. This is when Al-Hakim ordered for the complete destruction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. After Al-Hakim died, his successor allowed the Byzantine Emperor to rebuild the church, and Catholics again started to make their trips to Jerusalem but the rise of the Muslims was too much for the Roman Catholic Church. In the year 1095, Pope Urban convened the Council of Clermont in central France. He told listeners that the Muslims were advancing into the heart of Christian lands, mistreating the population and desecrating their shrines and churches. He told them that the emperor of the Byzantine Empire had called for help and it was the duty of the West to respond. He emphasized the special holiness of Jerusalem and told how pilgrims had suffered on their journeys there. He then made a great appeal to let the West go and rescue the East. He said that the nobility should stop fighting one another and instead fight a righteous war. And on top of that, he said that for those who died in battle, there would be a remission of sins. <laughs> let me just say that this is ridiculous and exactly a big reason of how and why the truth in Yahshua is condemned by the world. Because man has placed themselves as authority, then condones war, then feels that they can forgive soldiers for the war they contributed in if they die. It's ultimate control. Anyways, this was the start of the First Crusade. You've heard of the First Crusade. This is a subject that is not taught much in our school history class. In the year 1099, the Crusaders, which consisted of about 1,200 knights, now, this was not the Knights Templar, they did not exist yet in this crusade. The Templars fought in the second. But yeah, 1,200 knights and 15,000 men took back Jerusalem. And after this condensed history, this is where we begin to meet the Knights Templar. The formation of the Templars 
is said to start from the insecurity on the roads where there was murder, rape, enslavement, and robbery of unarmed pilgrims to Jerusalem. A group of nine French knights had proposed to the Patriarch of Jerusalem at the time, and King Baldwin II, that for the salvation of their souls, they would form a community or withdraw to a life in a monastery. But Baldwin persuaded them to save their souls by protecting pilgrims on the road, and they should take a vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience. On Christmas Day of the year 1118, those nine knights took their vows before the patriarch in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, calling themselves in Latin the Papyrus Colmaton Christi, the poor fellow soldiers of Christ. Their declared objective was, as far as their strength permitted, they should keep the roads and highways safe, with a special regard for the protection of pilgrims. King Baldwin II gave the Al-Aqsa Mosque to the poor fellow soldiers, and they made it their headquarters. But here's the deal. First off, there is no record of them actually defending the pilgrims on the road, and King Baldwin did have a royal historian under his command. His name was Folk de Schatz, but there is no record of the Templars' early activities in his 50 years of writing. In fact, there is only one writer about the beginning of the Templars, and that's Galam of Tyre. He wrote about them sometime in 1175 and 1185, so he was not a first-hand witness of their beginnings, but he is the only source we can gain info about their beginnings. He writes that in their first nine years, they did not allow new membership. It was just the nine of them. And it of course becomes suspicious when you try to understand how only nine knights could protect all the roads for the traveling pilgrims and not recruit members to assist them. This beginning history makes no sense. And not much is known. The main rumor is that during those nine years, they found something under Solomon's temple. Many people claim it was the Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail, but no one knows for sure. Whatever it was, it was said to give them enormous power, only second to the Pope, and they were known as Templars because of them working at Solomon's temple. Within a decade from their beginning, the Templars' fame seemed to have spread back to Europe. By 1128, a tract praising their virtues and qualities was issued by St. Bernard. St. Bernard at the time was the chief spokesman of the Christian world. He said, in praise of the new knighthood, he declares the Templars to be the epitome and apotheosis of Christian values. By 1127, most of the nine knights returned to Europe from Jerusalem. In January of 1128, a church council was convened at Troyes and at this council, the Templars were officially recognized and incorporated as a religious military order. Hughes de Payen was given the title of Grand Master. He and his subordinates were to be warrior monks, soldier mystics, a militia of Christ, Christ's soldiers. <laughs> the Templars were sworn to poverty, chastity, and obedience. They were obliged to cut their hair, but forbidden to cut their beards and that distinguished themselves during a time when most men were clean-shaven. All members of the order were required to wear habits of surcoats and cloaks, and these soon evolved into the distinctive white clothing for which the Templars became famous for. Their behavior on the battlefield was strictly controlled too. For example, if one were captured, Templars were not allowed to ask for mercy or to ransom themselves. They were compelled to fight to the death. They were not permitted to retreat from battle unless the odds against them exceeded 3 to 1. In the year 1139, a papal bull was issued by Pope Innocent II. According to this bull, the Templars owned allegiance to no secular or ecclesiastical power other than the Pope himself. In other words, they were made totally independent of all kings, princes, and of all interference from both political and religious authorities. They had become a law unto themselves, an autonomous international empire, only to answer to the Pope, as I once said. Throughout Europe, younger sons of noble families flocked to enroll in the order's ranks, and vast donations in money, goods, and land were made from every quarter of the Christian world. Hughes de Payen, the first Grand Master of the Templars, donated his own properties, and all new recruits were obliged to do likewise. On admission to the order, a man was compelled to sign over all his possessions. 
Within a mere 12 months of the Council of Troyes, the order held substantial estates in France, England, Scotland, Flanders, Spain, and Portugal. Within another decade, it also held territory in Italy, Austria, Germany, Hungary, the Holy Land, and points east. Although individual knights were bound to their vow of poverty, this did not prevent the order from amassing wealth and on an unprecedented scale. All guests were welcomed. At the same time, the order was forbidden to dispose of anything, not even to ransom its leaders. The temple received in abundance, but as a matter of strict policy, it never gave. During the next hundred years, the Templars became a power with international influence. They were constantly engaged in high-level diplomacy among nobles and monarchs throughout the Western world and the Holy Land. Close links were forged with the Muslim world as well, like with the Assassins, their Muslim counterpart. The Assassins are actually claimed to be started by the Templars as well. The Templars' interests extended beyond war, diplomacy, and political intrigue though. In effect, they created and established the institution of modern banking we know today. By lending vast sums to destitute monarchs, they became the bankers for every throne in Europe and for certain Muslim potentates as well. With their network of common houses throughout Europe and the Middle East, they also organized, at modest interest rates, the safe and efficient transfer of money for merchant traders, a class that became increasingly dependent upon them. Money deposited in one city, for example, could be claimed and withdrawn in another city by means of promissory notes inscribed in intricate codes. The Templars thus became the primary money changers of the age, and the Paris common houses of the Templars became the center of European finance. They enjoyed a strong monopoly on the best and most advanced technology of their age, the best that could be produced by armorers, leather workers, stonemasons, military architects, and engineers. They contributed to the development of surveying, map making, road building, and navigation. They possessed their own seaports, shipyards, and fleet, a fleet both commercial and military, which was among the first to use the magnetic compass. So needless to say, they had amassed a great deal of power. By the year 1306, King Philip IV of France was extremely anxious to rid his territory of the Templars. They were much stronger and better organized than he could ever be. They were firmly established throughout France, and by this time, even their allegiance to the Pope was only nominal. Philip had no control over the order, and he also owed them money. Philip first had to enlist the cooperation of the Pope who the Templars owed allegiance and obedience. Between 1303 and 1305, the French king and his ministers engineered the kidnapping and death of one Pope, Pope Boniface VIII, and quite possibly the murder by poison of another, Pope Benedict XI. Then, in 1305, Philip managed to secure the election of his own candidate, the Archbishop of Bordeaux, to the vacant papal throne. The new pontiff took the name Pope Clement V. Indebted as he was to Philip's influence, he could hardly refuse the king's demands, and these demands included the eventual suppression of the Knights Templar. Philip planned his moves carefully. A list of charges was compiled, partly from the king's spies who had infiltrated the order, partly from the voluntary confession of alleged renegade Templar. He issued and sealed secret orders to his stewards throughout the country. These orders were to be opened everywhere simultaneously and implemented at once. At dawn, on Friday, October the 13th, the year 1307, all Templars in France were to be seized and placed under arrest by the king's men. Their common houses placed under royal sequestration. Their goods were confiscated. And this is where we get the famous Friday the 13th from. Whether the Templars were warned in advance or whether they deduced what was in the wind, certain precautions were definitely taken. The knights who were captured seemed to have submit passively, as if they were under instruction to do so. There is persuasive evidence of some sort of organized flight by a particular group of knights, virtually all of whom were in some way connected with the order's treasurer. So it's not surprising that the treasure of the temple together with almost all his documents and records, should have disappeared. Now, the Templars were said to be devil worshippers. They worshipped an idol called the Baphomet. At their secret ceremonies, they supposedly prostrated themselves before a bearded male head 
which spoke to them and invested them with occult powers. Unauthorized witnesses of these ceremonies were never seen again, and there were other charges as well, which were even more vague. Accusations of infanticide, killing a child within a year of birth, or teaching women how to abort, also of obscene kisses at the abduction of their new candidates, and also accusations of homosexuality. Their biggest accusation was that these Christian knights ritually denied Christ, and they trampled and spit on the cross. In the year 1312, the Templars were officially dissolved. In March 1314, Jacques de Molay, the Grand Master, was burned to death over a slow fire. With his execution along with others, the Templars apparently vanished from the stage of history. But the order did not cease to exist given the number of knights who escaped, who remained at large, or who were even acquitted. The papal bulls that King Philip sent dissolving the order was never proclaimed in Scotland, and therefore the order was never technically dissolved in Scotland. Many English and French Templars found a Scottish refuge. This is important to know. In Portugal, the order was cleared by an inquiry and simply modified its names, becoming the Knights of Christ. Ships of the Knights of Christ sailed under the familiar red patty cross, and it was under the same cross that Christopher Columbus's three caravels crossed the Atlantic to the New World. Columbus himself was married to the daughter of a former Knight of Christ and had access to his father-in-law's charts and diaries. Interesting, right? The Templars were presented in history as Christian soldiers who fought for the glory of Christ, but there was a dark side to them that was done in secret. They were sorcerers and magicians and alchemists. Many of the people that lived during their time shunned them, believing them to be in league with unclean powers. They were the beginning of the known black magic-based organizations that were brought to the light. They were also known to be guardians of the Holy Grail, which is very important to know. But we won't go in depth about the Holy Grail in this video. So with all this history, what is the significance of the Templars? They obviously are not a religion, so why am I speaking about them in this series? You see, the Templars are the beginning to what we know as secret societies. Now I'm not saying that secret societies did not exist before the Templars, because that is not true. We have the Cathars, the Priory of Sion, and others. But the Templars are the most known, and they are the spark of the many secret societies that came about after they were said to dissolve. Remember how I said they were never dissolved in Scotland? Where do you think Scottish Rite Freemasonry comes from? You see, many Freemasons claim the Templars as their predecessors. Certain Masonic rites or observances claim direct lineal descent from the Templar order, as well as authorized custody of its arcane secrets. Certain Masonic lodges have adopted the grade of Templar, as well as rituals and names and titles supposedly descended from the original order. The global banking dynasties, the elite families of the ages, all take upon certain characteristics of the Templars, and it's said that the wealth and secrets of the Templars were passed down and over to the elites, what we refer to as the Illuminati today. It's no coincidence that our current modern-day banking system was modeled after theirs. The Templars were the practitioners of black magic that became the foundation of many secret societies today, and we cannot understand the plots and schemes of the devil without understanding the groups and orders that he established among the ages. We, of course, will never know all of the secrets, but we can have an understanding so that we are not overtaken by their lies. Before we jump into the history of the more modern religions, we need to understand how they all got here in the first place. What we see with the Templars and the church was the break between white magic and black magic. The church being the white magic and the Templars being the black magic. All the same goals, but the white magic did not approve of the black magic's method. So the black magic went underground and formed secret societies. They were no longer sworn monks like the Templars in public. They established themselves in society, becoming businessmen and scholars, thrusting themselves into the public world. But in secret, they pledged allegiance to dark black magic powers, and this is why they were secret societies. They hid from the church. And if I did not give you a foundation of the Templars, the information following them would be incomplete. This series was made to inform you. The truth of the Bible and the gospel needed to be laid out first. But now we are moving into the lies of the enemy, 
And that's where all the other religions lie within. When we look at all the other religions and other lies, you almost always see the influence of these secret societies. So if I do not give you the background on them, many things may go past you. I want you informed and knowledgeable so that we weaken the hold of the devil because he wants you blind, ignorant, and stupid. The other major part of the Templars has to do with the Holy Grail, but I cannot go into that without setting the stage. Freemasonry also needs to be understood, but I can't go into that without you understanding the Templars. They are the basis of understanding, the start of the secret societies, and if you want to understand where this world is heading, understanding the secret societies will assist you greatly. Through the Bible, we know where the world is headed. We understand the conflict. We understand the phases and the trumpets and bold judgments that will be poured out. We understand the ending with the Millennial Kingdom. But one thing we do not understand is the enemy side of the story. And if we never look to what they have done throughout history in the darkness, we will be overtaken like many of us have been since birth. They have established great systems of communication and infrastructure, massive economic and political orders, religious structures that dominate the world. And without much of an understanding of the past, much of this history can go by the majority of us. The thing is that they write about these things. They do not completely hide their secrets. They just place them in books and then deter us from reading them. Why do you think the saying is that if you want to tell a secret, put it in a book? I'm not divulging some great information that the masses have not been told. I'm not a whistleblower. I've never been a part of any of these organizations. I've just been a student for many years, reading many books, reading many sources, and I now am trying to teach all the things that I've read and learned so that others have a strong view of the real world and not the fake one that we have been led to believe in. All the roots of the secret societies start here, when they came out into the public eye and began recruiting with the Templars. All the infrastructure of the secret societies, the wealth, the occult powers, they can all be traced back to the Templars. And the thing is that many of us probably never even heard of them. Or what we have heard is not more than their names. As we rush towards these end times, we are entering their worlds that they have been creating in the dark. We cannot escape it, but knowledge and understanding will keep our hearts and our minds protected from lies and schemes. And that's the purpose of the History of Religion series. Knowledge is power. And I hope that from this part in the series, many people have been given more power. Be blessed. Okay, thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please make sure to like this and share it. If you have not already done so, please make sure to subscribe to this channel. Elohim willing, I upload every Friday. Don't forget to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram. I want to thank everyone for all their support through this series, and I appreciate the prayers and support. All the messages of love and understanding were overwhelming, and they truly blessed me. As always, I want to thank all those who donate to this channel. Your donations are a sincere blessing to me. I am extremely appreciative of your love, offerings, and support. Okay, everyone. Thanks again for watching. I love you all.